The Lost Books Introduction The great things in this world are growth. This applies to books as well as to institutions. The Bible is a growth. Many people do not understand that it is not a book written by a single person, but it is a library of several books which were composed by various people in various countries. It is interesting to know how this library grew and upon what principle some books were accepted and some rejected. Of course, we may take people's word for the reasons why certain books were chosen, but it is always satisfactory to come to our own conclusions by examining our own evidence. This is what this loose lost books of the Bible enables us to do. We can examine the books of the scriptures which we have in the authorized version, and then in this book we can read those scriptures which have been eliminated by various councils in order to make up our standard Bible. It is safe to say that a comparison of the accepted books which those rejected may be relied upon for those books which were accepted are far superior in value to the others. These others, which are included in the lost books of the Bible, comprise all kinds of stories, tales, and myths. No great figure appears in history without myths growing up about him. Every great personage becomes innocuous or center about which folk tales cluster. There are apocryphal tales about Napoleon, about Charlie Magni, about Julius Caesar, and other outstanding characters. It is impossible that a man representing so great a force as Jesus of Nazareth should appear in the world without finding many echoes of his personality. In contemporary literature, many stories which grew up about him as time elapsed. What these tales and stories are, just how he appears to the fictional minds of his day, and afterwards it is interesting to note, very often the fiction writer depicts life and the great truth of life better than the historian. He does not pretend to write down what is exactly true, but he tinges all things with his imagination. His feelings, however, may be just and reliable. The reading of these lost books of the Bible is interesting, as a matter of course. All who in any way are attracted by the personage of Jesus are interested to know any stories that may have grown up about him. They are also valuable because they enable us to get many a point of view which otherwise would have been lost. History may be true, but in a sense tradition is even truer. It has been said that history records what has been, but tradition tells what ought to have been. It must be remembered also that such a thing as historical accuracy is a comparatively novel product. The older writers never dreamed of it. They wrote in order to be interesting, not to tell the truth. And it is a remarkable fact that the events recorded in the Holy Scriptures, as far as we can find out, were most of them veritable, and the chroniclers were truthful. In this volume, all these apocryphal volumes are presented without argument or commentation. The reader's own judgment and common sense are appealed to. It makes no difference whether he is Catholic or Protestant or Hebrew. The facts are plainly laid before him. These facts for a long time have been the peculiar esoteric property of the learned. They were available only in the original Greek, in Latin, and so forth. Now they have been translated and brought in plain English before the eye of every reader. The ordinary man has therefore the privilege of seeing upon what grounds the commonly accepted scriptures rest. He can examine the pile of evidence and do his own sifting. 
thousands of people today look to the New Testament narrative as their leader and guide. It is important to know upon what authority this rests, and many a man will be delighted to find the evidence that is clearly presented before him. The lost books of the Bible present all sorts of matter before the curious eye. There are stories about Mary and instances of her personal life. There are other stories about the boyhood of Jesus and in the instances about his crucifixion. All of these become important because of the central figure about whom they revolve. No man has ever appealed to the imagination of the world and so played upon its feelings as has Jesus of Nazareth. It is interesting to know what forms of stories and speculations about him took place in the early period of the Christian era. In other words, the ordinary man is invited to take his place in that council chamber which accepts and rejects the various writings of Scripture. It is safe to say that the conclusions desired can safely be left to his common sense. It can no longer be said that our scriptures were accepted by learned men. You do not know that, but you must accept their conclusions. Now it has shown you upon what grounds these conclusions rest. As a believer in the authenticity of our accepted scriptures, I have no hesitancy in saying that I am perfectly satisfied to let the common sense of the world decide upon the superiority of the accepted text. The publication of this book will do good because it takes away the veil of secrecy that has hidden for many years the act of the church in accepting certain scriptures and rejecting others. All of the grounds are rendered perfectly intelligible to the common man. Preface You will find between these covers all the ecclesiastical writings of early Christian authorities that are known to exist and yet were omitted from the authorized New Testament. They are published here as a matter of record. Whether they are canonical or not, at least these writings are of very great antiquity. Origins are noted in paragraphs at the front of each book. This will enable the reader to form his own conclusions as to the genuineness of the writings. These writings are a vivid picture of the minds of men in the post-apostolic period of the Church. Discount the statesmen from the historical viewpoint as you will. There remains in these Gospels and epistles an earnestness of purpose and zeal to express a message similar to that of our authorized Bible. An interesting question naturally arises as to why these writings were cast out in the selection of the material that has come down to us in the authorized version. The compilation of the Bible was not an act of any definite occurrence. It was a matter complicated and abstruse. It was an evolution at the hands of churchmen of various beliefs and purposes. In the formulation of early church doctrines, there was dissension, personal jealousy, intolerance, persecution, bigotry, that out of this welter should have arisen the Bible, with its fine inspiration would seem to present a plausible basis for belief in its divine origin. But who can deny that under such vicious and human circumstances, much writing of as pure purpose and as profound sincerity as other that is included in the authorized Bible must have been omitted. The story of the first council of Nice, when Arius was commanded by the bishop of Alexandria to quit his beliefs or be declared a heretic, and his writings were ordered destroyed, is eloquent of many things that happened. Good men were engaged in both sides of the ecclesiastical controversies. 
about two-thirds of this volume is occupied with epistles. Beginning on page 91, you will discover otherwise generally unknown letters of Paul and illuminating letters of Clement and others, concluding with correspondence and reports of Herod, Pontius Pilate, and Tiberius Caesar. Concerning these epistles, Archbishop of Canterbury Wake, who translated them from the original, says that here is a full and perfect collection of all the genuine writings that remain to us of the Apostolic Fathers and carry on the antiquity of the Church from the time of the Holy Scriptures of the New Testament to about a hundred and fifty years after Christ. They accept the Holy scriptures there is nothing remaining of the truly genuine christian antiquity more early that they contain all that can with any certainty be depended upon of the most primitive fathers who had not only the advantage of living in the apostolot apostolical times of hearing the holy apostles and conversing with them but were most of them persons of a very eminent character in the church, too, though we cannot with any reason doubt of what they delivered to us as the gospel of Christ, but ought to receive it, if not with equal veneration, yet but a little less respect than we do the sacred writings of those who were their masters and instructors, and if, says the archbishop, it shall be asked how I came to choose the drudgery of a translator rather than the more ingenious part of publishing somewhat of my own composing. It was, in short, this, because I hoped that such writings as these would find a more general and unprejudiced acceptance with all sorts of men than anything that could be written by anyone now living. This collection of the lost books of the Bible is published without prejudice or motive, save that the reader may find whatever pleases and instructs him, and may be free to enjoy his own speculation and hold his own opinion of these ancient and beautiful writings. R. H. B. Jr., New York, January 1, 1926 Intro the Gospel of the Birth of Mary In the primitive ages, there was a gospel extant bearing this name attributed to St. Matthew and received as genuine and authentic by several of the ancient Christian sects. It is to be found in the works of Jerome, a father of the church, who flourished in the 4th century from whence the present translation is made. His contemporaries Epiphanius, Bishop of Salamis and Austin, also mention a gospel under this title. The ancient copies differed from Jerome's for from one of them that the learned Faustus, a native of Britain who became Bishop of Reis in Provence, endeavored to prove that Christ was not the Son of God till after his baptism and that he was not of the house of David and tribe of Judah, because according to the gospel he cited, the virgin herself was not of this tribe, but of the tribe of Levi, her father being a priest of the name of Joachim. It was likewise from this gospel that the sect of the Coleridians established the worship and offering of manchet bread and cracknels, or fine wafers, as sacrifices to Mary, whom they imagined to have been born of a virgin, as Christ is related in the canonical gospel to have been born of her. Epiphanius likewise cites a passage concerning the death of Zacharias, which is not in Jerome's copy, viz. that it was the occasion of the death of Zacharias in the temple, that when he had seen a vision, he drew surprise, was willing to disclose it, and his mouth was stopped that which he saw was at the time of his offering incense, and it was a man standing in the form of an ass, when he was gone out and had a mind to speak thus to the people, Woe unto you, whom do ye worship? He who had appeared to him in the temple took away the use of his speech, 
Afterwards, when he recovered it and was able to speak, he declared this to the Jews, and they slew him. They had this diagnostics in this book, that on this very account the high priest was appointed by their lawgiver by God to Moses to carry little bells that whensoever he went into the temple to sacrifice, he whom they worshipped hearing the noise of the bells might have time enough to hide himself and not be caught in that ugly shape and figure. The principal part of this gospel is contained in the Protevagelion of James, which follows next in order. The Gospel of the Birth of Mary, Chapter 1 The Parentage of Mary Joachim, her father, and Anna, her mother, go to Jerusalem to the Feast of the Dedication. Ezekiel, the high priest, reproaches Joachim for being childless. The blessed and ever-glorious Virgin Mary, sprung from the royal race and family of David, was born in the city of Nazareth and educated at Jerusalem in the temple of the Lord. Her father's name was Joachim and her mother's Anna. The family of her father was of Galilee and the city of Nazareth. The family of her mother was of Bethlehem. Their lives were plain and right in the sight of the Lord, pious and faultless before men, for they divided all their substance into three parts, one of which they devoted to the temple and officers of the temple, another they they distributed among strangers and persons in poor circumstances, and the third they reserved for themselves and the uses of their own family. In this manner, they lived for about twenty years chastely in the favor of God and the esteem of men without any children. But they vowed if God should favor them with any issue, they would devote it to the service of the Lord, on which account they went at every feast in the year to the temple of the Lord. Note Psalm 6, 7 and C. And it came to pass that when the feast of the dedication drew near, Joachim, with some others of his tribe, went up to Jerusalem, and at that time Issachar was high priest, who, when he saw Joachim, along with the rest of his neighbors, bringing his offering, despised both him and his offerings, and asked him, Why he, who had no children, would presume to appear among those who had, adding that his offerings could never be acceptable to God, who was judged by him unworthy to have children. The scripture having said, Cursed is everyone who shall not beget a male in Israel. He further said that he ought first to be free from that curse by begetting some issue and then come with his offerings into the presence of God. But Joachim, being much confounded with the shame of such reproach, retired to the shepherds who were with the cattle in their pastures, for he was not inclined to return home, lest his neighbors who were present and heard all this from the high priest should publicly reproach him in the same manner. Chapter 2 An angel appears to Joachim 9 and informs him that Anna shall conceive and bring forth a daughter who shall be called Mary be brought up in the temple, and while yet a virgin, in a way unparalleled, bring forth the Son of God, gives him a sign, and departs. But when he had been there for some time, on a certain day when he was alone, the angel of the Lord stood by him with a prodigious light, to whom being troubled at the appearance the angel had appeared to him, endeavoring to compose him, said, be not afraid, Joachim, nor troubled at the sight of me, for I am an angel of the Lord sent by him to you, that I might inform you that your prayers are heard and your alms ascended in the sight of God. Note Acts 10.4 For he had surely seen your shame and heard you unjustly reproached for not having children, 
for God is the avenger of sin and not of nature. And so when he shuts the womb of any person, he does it for this reason, that he may in a more wonderful manner again open it, and that which is born appear to be not the product of lust, but the gift of God. For the first mother of your nation, Sarah, was she not barren, even till her eightieth year, and yet even in the end of her old age brought forth Isaac, in whom the promise was made a blessing to all nations. Rachel also so much in favor with God, and beloved so much by holy Jacob, continued barren for a long time, yet afterwards was the mother of Joseph, who was not only governor of Egypt, but delivered many nations from perishing with hunger. Who among the judges was more valiant than Samson, or more holy than Samuel? And yet both their mothers were barren. But if reason will not convince you of the truth of my words, that there are frequent conceptions in advanced years, and that those who were barren have brought forth to their great surprise, therefore Anna, your wife, shall bring you a daughter, and you shall call her name Mary. She shall... According to your vow, be devoted to the Lord from her infancy, and be filled with the Holy Ghost from her mother's womb. She shall neither eat nor drink anything which is unclean, nor shall her conversation be without among the common people. But in the temple of the Lord, that so she may not fall under any slander or suspicion of what is bad. So in the process of her years, as she shall be in a miraculous manner, born of one that was barren, so she shall, while, while yet a virgin, in a way unparalleled, bring forth the Son of the Most High God, who shall be called Jesus, and according to the signification of his name, be the Savior of all nations. And this shall be a sign to you of the things which I declare, namely, when you come to the golden gate of Jerusalem, you shall there meet your wife Anna, who, being very much troubled that you return no sooner, shall then rejoice to see you. When the angel had said this, he departed from him. Chapter 3 The angel appears to Anna, tells her a daughter shall be born unto her, devoted to the service of the Lord in the temple who, being a virgin and not knowing man, shall bring forth the Lord, and gives her a sign. Therefore, Joachim and Anna meet and rejoice, and praise the Lord. Anna conceives and brings forth a daughter called Mary. Afterwards, the angel appeared to Anna, his wife, saying, Fear not, neither think that which you see is a spirit. For I am that angel who had offered up your prayers and alms before God, and am now sent to you, that I may inform you that a daughter will be born unto you, who shall be called Mary, and shall be blessed above all women. She shall be immediately upon her birth full of the grace of the Lord, and shall continue during the three years of her weaning in her father's house, and afterwards being devoted to the service of the Lord, shall not depart from the temple till she arrives to years of discretion. In a word, she shall there serve the Lord night and day in fasting and prayer, shall abstain from every unclean thing and never know any man, but being an unparalleled instance without any pollution or defilement, and a virgin not knowing any man shall bring forth a son, and a maid shall bring forth the Lord, who both by his grace and name and works shall be the Savior of the world. Arise, therefore, and go up to Jerusalem, and when you shall come to that which is called the Golden Gate, because it is gilt with gold, as a sign of what I have told you, you shall meet your husband, for whose safety you have been so much concerned. When, therefore, you find these things thus accomplished, Believe that all the rest which I have told you shall also undoubtedly be accomplished. According, therefore, to the command of the angel, 
Both of them left the places where they were. And when they came to the place specified in the angel's prediction, they met each other. Then rejoicing at each other's vision, and being fully satisfied in the promise of a child, they gave due thanks to the Lord, who exalts the humble. After having praised the Lord, they returned home and lived in a cheerful and assured expectation of the promise of God. So Anna conceived and brought forth a daughter, and according to the angel's command, the parents did call her name Mary. Chapter 4 Mary brought to the temple at three years old, ascends the stairs of the temple by miracle, her parents sacrificed and returned home. And when three years were expired and the time of her weaning complete, they brought the virgin to the temple of the Lord with offerings, and they were about the temple according to the 15 Psalms of degrees. Note, those Psalms are from 120th to the 134th, including both 15 stairs to ascend. For the temple being built in a mountain, the altar burnt offering, which was without could not be come near by, by the stairs. The parents of the Blessed Virgin and Infant Mary put her upon one of these stairs. But while they were putting off their clothes in which they had traveled, and according to the custom putting on some that were more neat and clean, in the meantime the Virgin of the Lord in such a manner went up all the stairs one after another, without the help of any to lead or lift her, that any one would have judged from hence that she was of perfect age. Thus the Lord did in the infancy of his virgin work his extraordinary work, and evidenced by this miracle how great she was like to be hereafter. But the parents having offered up their sacrifice according to the custom of the law, and perfected their vow left the virgin with other virgins in the apartments of the temple, who were to be brought up there, and they returned home. Chapter 5 Mary ministered unto by angels. The high priest orders all virgins of fourteen years old to quit the temple and endeavor to be married. Mary refuses, having vowed her virginity to the Lord. The high priest commands a meeting of the chief persons of Jerusalem, who seek the Lord for counsel in the matter. A voice from the mercy seat, the high priest obeys it by ordering all the unmarried men of the house of David to bring their rods to the altar, that his rod which should flower, and on which the Spirit of God should sit, should betroth the virgin. But the virgin of the Lord, as she advanced in fears, increased also in perfections, and according to the saying of the psalmist, her father and mother forsook her, but the Lord took care of her. For she every day had a conversation of angels, and every day received visitors from God, which preserved her from all sorts of evil, and caused her to abound with all good things, so that when at length she arrived to her fourteenth year, as the wicked could not lay anything to her charge worthy of reproof, so all good persons who were acquainted with her admired her life and conversation. At that time the high priest made a public order that all the virgins who had public settlements in the temple and were come to this age should return home, and as they were now of a proper maturity, should, according to the custom, of their country endeavor to be married, to which command, though all the other virgins readily yielded obedience, Mary the Virgin of the Lord alone answered that she could not comply with it. Assigning these reasons that both she and her parents had devoted her to the service of the Lord, and besides that she had vowed virginity to the Lord, which vow she was resolved never to break through by lying with a man, the high priest being hereby brought into a difficulty, seeing he durst neither on the one hand dissolve the vow and disobey the scripture, which says vow and pay nor on the other hand introduce a custom to which the people were strangers commanded 
that at the approaching feast, all the principal persons both of Jerusalem and the neighboring places should meet together, that he might have their advice how he had best proceed in so difficult a case. When they were accordingly met, they anonymously agreed to seek the Lord and ask counsel from him on this matter. And when they were all engaged in prayer, the high priest, according to the usual way, went to consult God, and immediately there was a voice from the ark and the mercy seat which all present heard that it must be inquired or sought out by a prophecy of Isaiah, to whom the virgin should be given and be betrothed. For Isaiah said, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and the flower shall spring out of its roof, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and pity, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord shall fill him. Then according to this prophecy, he appointed that all the men of the house and family of David, who were marriageable and not married, should bring their several rods to the altar. And out of whatsoever person's rod after it was brought, a flower should bud forth, and on the top of it the spirit of the Lord should sit in the appearance of a dove, he should be the man to whom the virgin should be given and be betrothed. Chapter 6 Joseph throws back his rod. The dove pitches on it. He betroths Mary and returns to Bethlehem. Mary returns to her parents' house at Galilee. Among the rest, there was a man named Joseph of the house and family of David, and a person very far advanced in years who drew back his rod when everyone besides presented his, so that when nothing appeared agreeable to the heavenly voice, the high priest judged it proper to consult God again, who answered that he to whom the virgin was to be betrothed was the only person of those who were brought together who had not brought his rod. Joseph, therefore, was betrayed. For when he did bring his rod, and a dove coming from heaven pitched upon the top of it, every one plainly saw that the virgin was to be betrothed to him. Accordingly, the usual ceremonies of betrothing being over, he returned to his own city of Bethlehem to set his house in order and make the needful for the marriage. But the virgin of the Lord Mary, with seven other virgins of the same age, who had been weaned at the same time, and who had been appointed to attend her by the priest, returned to her parents' house in Galilee. Chapter 7 The Salutation of the Virgin by Gabriel, who explains to her that she shall conceive without lying with a man, while a virgin, but the Holy Ghost coming upon her without the heats of lust, she submits. Now at this time of her first coming into Galilee, the angel Gabriel was sent to her from God to declare to her the conception of our Savior and the manner and way of her conceiving him. Accordingly, going into her, he filled the chamber where she was with a prodigious light, and in a most courteous manner saluting her, he said, Hail Mary, Virgin of the Lord, most acceptable. O virgin full of grace, the Lord is with you. You are blessed above all women. You are blessed above all men that have been hitherto born. But the virgin who had before been well acquainted with the countenances of angels and to whom such light from heaven was no uncommon thing, was neither terrified with the vision of the angel nor astonished at the greatness of the light, but only troubled about the angel's words, and began to consider what so extraordinary a salutation should mean, what it did portend, or what sort of end it would have. To this thought the angel, divinely inspired, replies, Fear not, Mary, as though I intended anything inconsistent with your chastity in this salutation. For you have found favor with the Lord, because you made virginity your choice. 
Therefore, while you are virgin, you shall conceive without sin, and bring forth a son. He shall be great, because he shall reign from sea to sea, and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. And he shall be called the Son of the Highest, for he who is born in a mean state on earth reigns in an exalted one in heaven. And the Lord shall give him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. For he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and his throne is forever and ever. To this discourse of the angel the virgin replied not, as though she were unbelieving, but willing to know the manner of it. She said, How can that be? For seeing according to my vow, I have never known any man. How can I bear a child without the addition of a man's seed? To this the angel replied and said, Think not, Mary, that you shall conceive in the ordinary way. For without lying with a man while a virgin, you shall conceive. While a virgin, you shall bring forth, and while a virgin, shall give suck. For the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you without any of the heats of lust. So that which shall be born of you shall be only holy, because it only is conceived without sin, and being born shall be called the Son of God. Then Mary, stretching forth her hands and lifting her eyes to heaven, said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, let it be unto me according to thy word. Chapter 8 Joseph returns to Galilee to marry the virgin he had betrothed. Perceives she is with child, is uneasy, purposes to put her away privily. Is told by the angel of the Lord, It is not the work of man, but the Holy Ghost. Marries her, but keeps chaste. Removes with her to Bethlehem, where she brings forth Christ. Joseph therefore went from Judea to Galilee, with intention to marry the virgin who was betrothed to him. For it was now near three months since he, she was betrothed to him. At length it plainly appeared she was with child, and it could not be hid from Joseph. For going to the virgin in a free manner as one is spouse and talking familiarly with her, he perceived her to be with child, and thereupon began to be uneasy and doubtful, not knowing what course it would be best to take. For being a just man, he was not willing to expose her nor defame her by the suspicion of being a whore, since he was a pious man. He purposed, therefore, privately to put an end to their agreement and as privately to put her away. But while he was meditating these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in his sleep and said, Joseph, son of David, fear not. Be not willing to entertain any suspicion of the virgin's being guilty of fornication or to think anything amiss of her. Neither be afraid to take her to wife, for that which is begotten in her and now distresses your mind is not the work of man, but the Holy Ghost. For she of all women is that only virgin who shall bring forth the Son of God, and you shall call his name Jesus, that is Savior, for he will save his people from their sins. Joseph thereupon, according to the command of the angel, married the virgin and did not know her, but kept her in chastity. And now the ninth month from her conception drew near, when Joseph took his wife and what other things were necessary to Bethlehem, the city from whence they came. And it came to pass, while they were there, the days were fulfilled for her bringing forth and she brought forth her firstborn son, as the holy evangelists have taught, even our Lord Jesus Christ, who with the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, lives and reigns to everlasting ages. Intro, the Protevangelion, the Protevangelion, or an historical account of the birth of Christ and the perpetual Virgin Mary, his mother, by James the Lesser, 
cousin and brother of the Lord Jesus, chief apostle and first bishop of the Christians in Jerusalem. This gospel is ascribed to James. The allusions to it in the ancient fathers are frequent, and their expressions indicate they had obtained a very general credit in the Christian world. The controversies founded upon it chiefly relate to the age of Joseph and the birth of Christ and to his being a widower with children. Before his marriage with a virgin, it seems material to remark that the legends of the latter ages affirm the virginity of Joseph, notwithstanding Epiphanius, Hilary, Chrysostom, Cyril, Atimius, Tephelac, Ocumenius, and indeed all the Latin fathers, till Ambrose and the Greek fathers afterwards, maintained the opinions of Joseph's age and family, founded upon their belief in the authenticity of this book. It is supposed to have been originally composed in Hebrew. Postelius brought the MS of this gospel from the Levant, translated it into Latin, and sent it to Oporimus, a printer at Basel, where Bibliander, a Protestant divine and a professor of divinity at Zurich, caused it to be printed in 1552. Postelius asserts that it was publicly read as canonical in the Eastern churches, the making no doubt that James was the author of it. It is nevertheless considered apocryphal, apocryphal by some of the most learned divines in the Protestant and Catholic churches. The Protevagilion Chapter 1 Joachim, a rich man, offers to the Lord, is opposed by Reuben, the high priest, because he was not begotten, issue in Israel, retires into the wilderness and fasts forty days and forty nights. In the history of the twelve tribes of Israel, we read there was a certain person called Joachim, who, being very rich, made double that is, gave as much more as he was obliged to give offerings to the Lord God, having made this resolution. My substance shall be for the benefit of the whole people, and I may find mercy from the Lord God for the forgiveness of my sins. But at a certain great feast of the Lord, when the children of Israel offered their gifts, and Joachim also offered his, Reuben the high priest opposed him, saying, It is not lawful for thee to offer thy gifts, seeing thou hast not begot any issue in Israel. At this Joachim being concerned very much, went away to consult the registries of the twelve tribes to see whether he was the only person who had begot no issue. But upon in inquiry, he found that all the righteous had raised up seed in Israel. Then he called to mind the patriarch Abraham, how that God in the end of his life had given him his son Isaac, upon which he, has, he was exceedingly distressed. I would not be seen by his wife, but retired into the wilderness and fixed his tent there, and fasted forty days and forty nights, saying to himself, I will not go down either to eat or drink, till the Lord my God shall look upon me, but prayer shall be my meat and drink. Note in imitation of the forty days and nights fast of Moses recorded Exodus Chapter 2 Anna, the wife of Joachim, mourns her barrenness, is reproached with it by Judith, her maid, sits under a laurel tree, and prays to the Lord. In the meantime, his wife Anna was distressed and perplexed on a double account and said, I will mourn both for my widowhood and my barrenness. Then drew near a great fast feast of the Lord. And Judith, her maid, said, How long will you thus afflict your soul? The feast of the Lord is now come, when it is unlawful for anyone to mourn. Take therefore this hood, which was given by one who makes such things, for it is not fit that I, 
who am a servant, should wear it, but it will suit a person of your greater character. But Anna replied, Depart from me, I am not used to such things. Besides, the Lord had greatly humbled me. I fear some ill-designing person had given thee this, and thou art come to pollute me with my sin. Then Judith her maid answered, What evil shall I wish you when you will not hearken to me? I cannot wish you a greater curse than you are under, in that God has shut up your womb, that you should not be a mother in Israel. At this Anna was exceedingly troubled, and having on her wedding garment, went about three o'clock in the afternoon to walk in her garden. And she saw a laurel tree, and sat under it, and prayed unto the Lord, saying, O God of my fathers, bless me, and regard my prayer as thou didst bless the womb of Sarah, and gave us her son, Isaac. Chapter 3 Anna, perceiving a sparse nest in the laurels, bemoans her barrenness. And as she was looking towards heaven, she perceived a sparrow's nest in the laurel. And mourning within herself, she said, Woe is me, who begat me, and what womb did bear me, that I should be thus a curse before the children of Israel, and that they should reproach and deride me in the temple of my God. Woe is me, to what can I be compared? I am not comparable to the very beasts of the earth. For even the beasts of the earth are fruitful before thee, O Lord. Woe is me, to what can I be compared? I am not comparable to the brute animals, for even the brute animals are fruitful before thee, O Lord. Woe is me, to what am I comparable? I cannot be compared to these waters, for even the waters are fruitful before thee, O Lord. Woe is me, to what can I be compared? I am not comparable to the waves of the sea, for these, whether they are calm or in motion, where the fishes which are in them praise thee, O Lord. Woe is me, to what can I be compared? I am not comparable to the very earth, for the earth produces its fruits and praises thee, O Lord. Chapter 4 An angel appears to Anna and tells her she shall conceive. Two angels appear to her on the same errand, Joachim sacrifices. Anna goes to meet him, rejoicing that she shall conceive. Then an angel of the Lord stood by her and said, Anna, Anna, the Lord had heard thy prayer, thou shalt conceive and bring forth, and thy progeny shall be spoken of in all the world. And Anna answered, As the Lord my God liveth, whatever I bring forth, whether it be male or female, I will devote it to the Lord my God, and it shall minister to him in holy things during its whole life. And behold, there appeared two angels, saying unto her, Behold, Joachim, thy husband, is coming with his shepherds. For an angel of the Lord had also come down to him and said, The Lord God had heard thy prayer. Make haste and go hence, for behold, Anna, thy wife, shall conceive. And Joachim went down and called his shepherds, saying, Bring me hither ten she lambs without spot or blemish, and they shall be for the Lord my God. And bring me twelve calves without blemish, and the twelve calves shall be for the priests and the elders. Bring me also a hundred goats, and a hundred goats shall be for the whole people. And Joachim went down with the shepherds, and Anna stood by the gate, and saw Joachim coming with the shepherds. And she ran, and hanging about his neck, said, Now I know what the, that the Lord had greatly blessed me. For behold, I who was a widow am no longer a widow, and I who was barren shall conceive. Chapter 5 Joachim abides the first day in his house, but sacrifices on the morrow, consults the plate on the priest's forehead, and is without sin. Anna brings forth a daughter, whom she calls Mary. And Joachim abode the first day in his house, but on the morrow he brought his offerings and said, 
If the Lord be propitious to me, let the plate which is on the priest for it. Note such an instrument God had appointed the high priest to wear for such discoveries. Make it manifest. And he consulted the plate which the priest wore and saw it, and behold, sin was not found in him. And Joachim said, Now I know that the Lord is propitious to me, and had taken away all my sins. And he went down from the temple of the Lord justified, and he went to his own house. And when nine months were fulfilled to Anna, she brought forth and said to the midwife, What have I brought forth? And she told her, A girl. Then Anna said, The Lord had this day magnified my soul. And she laid her in bed. And when the days of her purification were accomplished, she gave suck to the child and called her name Mary. Chapter 6 Mary at nine months old walks nine steps. Anna keeps her holy. When she is a year old, Joachim makes a great feast. Anna gives her the breast and sings a song to the Lord. And the child increased in strength every day, so that when she was nine months old, her mother put her upon the ground to try if she could stand. And when she had walked nine steps, she came again to her mother's lap. Then her mother caught her up and said, As the Lord my God liveth, thou shalt not walk again on this earth till bring thee into the temple of the Lord. Accordingly, she made her chamber a holy place and suffered nothing uncommon or unclean to come near her, but invited certain undefiled daughters of Israel, and they drew her aside. But when the child was a year old, Joachim made a great feast and invited the priests, scribes, elders, and all the people of Israel. And Joachim then made an offering of the girl to the chief priest, and they blessed her, saying, God of our fathers, bless this girl, and give her a name famous and lasting through all generations. And all the people replied, So be it, Amen. Then Joachim a second time offered her to the priest, and they blessed her, saying, O Most High God, regard this girl, and bless her with an everlasting blessing. Upon this, her mother took her up and gave her the breast and sang the following song to the Lord. I will sing a new song unto the Lord my God, for he had visited me and taken away from me the reproach of mine enemies, and had given me the fruit of his righteousness, that I may now be told the sons of Reuben, that Anna gives suck, that then she put the child to rest in the room which she had consecrated, as she went out and ministered unto them. And when the feast was ended, they went away rejoicing and praising the God of Israel. Chapter 7 Mary being three years old, Joachim causes certain virgins to light each a lamp and goes with her to the temple. The high priest places her on the third step of the altar, and she dances with her feet. But the girl grew, and when she was two years old, Joachim said to Anna, Let us lead her to the temple of the Lord, that we may perform our vow, which we have vowed unto the Lord God, lest he should be angry with us and their offering be unacceptable. But Anna said, Let us wait the third year, lest she should be at a loss to know her father. And Joachim said, Let us then wait. And when the child was three years old, Joachim said, Let us invite the daughters of the Hebrews who are undefiled, and let them take each a lamp, and let them be lighted, that the child may not turn back again and her mind be set against the temple of the Lord. And they did thus till they ascended into the temple of the Lord, and the high priest received her and blessed her and said, Mary, the Lord God had magnified thy name to all generations, and to the very end of time by thee 
will the Lord shew his redemption to the children of Israel. And he placed her upon the third step of the altar, and the Lord gave unto her grace, and she danced with her feet, and all the house of Israel loved her. Chapter 8 Mary fed in the temple by angels. When twelve years old, the priests consult what to do with her. The angel of the Lord warned Zacharias to call together all the widowers, each bringing a rod. The people meet by the sound of trumpet. Joseph throws away his hatchet and goes to the meeting. A dove comes forth from his rod and alights on his head. He is chosen to betroth the virgin, refuses because he is an old man, is compelled, takes her home, and goes to mind his trade of building. And her parents went away filled with wonder and praising God because the girl did not return back to them. But Mary continued in the temple as a dove, educated her, and received her food from the hand of an angel. And when she was twelve years of age, the priests met in a council and said, Behold, Mary is twelve years of age. What shall we do with her? For fear lest the holy place of the Lord our God should be defiled. Then replied the priest to Zacharias the high priest, Do you stand at the altar of the Lord and enter into the holy place and make petitions concerning her? And whatsoever the Lord shall manifest unto you, that do. Then the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies, and taking away with him the breastplate of judgment, made prayers concerning her. And behold, the angel of the Lord came to him and said, Zacharias, Zacharias, go forth and call together all the widowers among the people, and let every one of them bring his rod, and be by him. And he by whom the Lord shall shew a sign shall be the husband of Mary. And the criers went out through all Judea, and the trumpet of the Lord sounded, and all the people ran and met together. Joseph also, throwing away the hatchet, went out to meet them. And when they were met, they went to the high priest, taking every man his rod. After the high priest had received the rods, he went into the temple to pray. And when he had finished his prayer, he took the rods and went forth and distributed them, and there was no miracle attended them. The last rod was taken by Joseph, and behold, a dove proceeded out of the rod and flew upon the head of Joseph. And the high priest said, Joseph, thou art the person chosen to take the virgin of the Lord to keep her for him. But Joseph refused, saying, I am an old man and have children, but she is young, and I fear lest I should appear ridiculous in Israel. Then the high priest replied, Joseph, fear the Lord thy God, and remember how God dealt with Dathan, Korah, and Abiram, how the earth opened and swallowed them up because of their contradiction. Now therefore, Joseph, fear God, lest the like things should happen in your family. Joseph then, being afraid, took her unto his house, and Joseph said unto Mary, Behold, I have taken thee from the temple of the Lord, and now I will leave thee in my house. I must go to mind my trade of building. The, the Lord be with thee. Chapter 9 The priests desire a new veil for the temple. So three seven virgins cast lots for making different parts of it. The lot to spin the true purple falls to Mary. Zacharias, the high priest, becomes dumb. Mary takes a pot to draw water and hears a voice, trembles, and begins to work. An angel appears and salutes her and tells her she shall conceive by the Holy Ghost. She submits, visits her cousin Elizabeth, whose child in her womb leaps. And it came to pass in the council of the priests, it was said, Let us make a new will for the temple. And the high priest said, Call together to me seven undefiled virgins of the tribe of David. And the servants went and brought them into the temple of the Lord, and the high priest said unto them, Cast lots before me now. 
who of you shall spin golden thread, who the blue, who the scarlet, who the fine linen, and who the true purple? Then the high priest knew Mary, that she was of the tribe of David, and he called her, and the true purple fell to her lot to spin, and she went away to her own house. But from that time Zacharias the high priest became dumb, and Samuel was placed in his room to, till Zacharias spoke again. But Mary took the true purple and did spin it. And she took a path and went out to draw water and heard a voice saying unto her, Hail thou who art full of grace, the Lord is with thee, thou art blessed among women. And she looked round to the right and to the left to see whence that voice came. And then trembling went into her house, and laying down the water pot, she took the purple and sat down in her seat to work it. And behold, the angel of the Lord stood by her and said, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor in the sight of God which when she heard, she reasoned with herself what the sort of salutation meant. And the angel said unto her, The Lord is with thee, and thou shalt conceive. To which she replied, What shall I conceive but a living God, and bring forth as all other women do? But the angel returned answer, Not so, O Mary, but the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. Wherefore thou which shall be born of thee shall be holy, and shall be called the Son of the living God. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she also had conceived a son in her old age, and this now is the sixth month with her, who was called barren for nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, let it be unto me according to the word. And when she had wrought her purple, she carried it to the high priest, and the high priest blessed her, saying, Mary, the Lord God had magnified thy name, and thou shalt be blessed in all the ages of the world. Then Mary, filled with joy, went away to her cousin Elizabeth, and knocked at the door. Which when Elizabeth heard, she ran and opened to her, and blessed her, and said, Whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come unto me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation reached my ears, that which is in me leaped and blessed thee. But Mary, being ignorant of all those mysterious things which the archangel Gabriel had spoken to her, lifted up her eyes to heaven, and said, Lord, what am I, that all the generations of the earth should, be, should call me blessed? But perceiving herself daily to grow big, and being afraid, she went home and hid herself from the children of Israel. I was fourteen years old when all these things happened. Chapter 10 Joseph returns from building houses, finds the virgin grown big, being six months gone with child, is jealous and troubled, reproaches her, she affirms her innocence, he leaves her, determines to dismiss her privately, is warned in a dream that Mary is with child by the Holy Ghost and glorifies God, who had shown him such favor. And when her sixth month was come, Joseph returned from his building houses abroad, which was his trade, and entering into the house, found the virgin grown big. Then smiting upon his face, he said, With what face can I look up to the Lord my God? Or what shall I say concerning this young woman? For I received her a virgin out of the temple of the Lord my God, and have not perceived her such. Who has thus deceived me? who has committed this evil in my house, and seducing the virgin from me, had defiled her. 
Is not the history of Adam exactly accomplished in me? For in the very instant of his glory, the serpent came and found Eve alone and seduced her. Just after the same manner, it has happened to me. Then Joseph, arising from the ground, called her and said, O thou who hast been so much favored by God, why hast thou done this? Why hast thou thus debased thy soul, who wast educated in the holy of holies, and received thy food from the hand of angels? But she with a flood of tears replied, I am innocent, and have known no man. Then said Joseph, How comes it to pass you are with child? Mary answered, As the Lord my God liveth, I know not by what means. Then Joseph was exceedingly afraid and went away from her, considering what he should do with her, and he thus reasoned with himself, If I conceal her crime, I shall be found guilty by the law of the Lord, and if I discover her to the children of Israel, I fear, lest she being with child by an angel, I shall be found to betray the life of an innocent person. What therefore shall I do? I will privately dismiss her. Then the night was come upon him, when, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, and said, Be not afraid to take that young woman, for that which is within her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Then Joseph arose from his sleep, and glorified the God of Israel, who had shown him such favor and preserved the virgin. Chapter 11 Annas visits Joseph, perceives the virgin big with child, informs the high priest that Joseph had privately married her. Joseph and Mary brought the trial on the church. Joseph drinks the water of the Lord as an ordeal, and receiving no harm, returns home. Then came Annas the scribe and said to Joseph, Wherefore have we not seen you since your return? And Joseph replied, Because I was weary after my journey and rested the first day. But Annas turning about perceived the virgin big with child. I went away to the priest and told him, Joseph, in whom you place so much confidence, is guilty of a notorious crime in that he had defiled the virgin whom he received out of the temple of the Lord, and had privately married her, not discovering it to the children of Israel. Then said the priest, Had Joseph done this? Annas replied, If you send any of your servants, you will find that she is with child. And the servants went and found it, as he said. Upon this both she and Joseph were brought to their trial, and the priest said unto her, Mary, what hast thou done? Why hast thou debased thy soul, and forgot thy God, seeing thou hast brought up in the holy of holies, and didst receive thy food from the hands of angels, and heard their songs? Why hast thou, hast thou done this? To which with a flood of tears she answered, As the Lord God, my God, as the Lord my God liveth, I am innocent in his sight, seeing I know no man. Then the priest said to Joseph, Why hast thou done this? And Joseph answered, As the Lord my God liveth, I have not been concerned with her. But the priest said, Lie not, but declare the truth. Thou hast privately married her and not discovered it to the children of Israel, and humbled itself under the mighty hand of God, that thy seed might be blessed. And Joseph was silent. Then said the priest to Joseph, You must restore to the temple of the Lord the virgin which you took thence. But he wept bitterly, and the priest added, I will cause you both to drink the water of the Lord, which is for trial, and so your iniquity shall be laid open before you. Then the priest took the water and made Joseph drink and sent him to a mountainous place. 
and he returned perfectly well, and all the people wondered that his guilt was not discovered. So the priest said, Since the Lord had not made your sins evident, neither do I condemn you. So he sent them away. Then Joseph took Mary and went to his house, rejoicing and praising the God of Israel. Chapter 12 A decree from Augustus for taxing the Jews. Joseph puts Mary on an ass to return to Bethlehem. She looks sorrowful. She laughs. Joseph inquires the cause of it. She tells him she sees two persons, one mourning and the other rejoicing, the delivery being near. He takes her from the ass and places her in a cave. And it came to pass that there went forth a decree from the emperor Augustus that all the Jews should be taxed, who were Bethlehem in Judea. And Joseph said, I will take care that my children be taxed, but what shall I do with this young woman? To have her taxed as my wife, I am ashamed. And if I tax her as my daughter, all Israel knows she is not my daughter. When the time of the Lord's appointment shall come, let him do as seems good to him. And he saddled the ass and put her upon it, and Joseph and Simon followed after her and arrived at Bethlehem with three miles. Then Joseph, turning about, saw Mary sorrowful and said within himself, Perhaps she is in pain through that which is within her. But when he turned about again, he saw her laughing and said to her, Mary, how happens it that I sometimes see sorrow and sometimes laughter and joy in the countenance? And Mary replied to him, I see two people with mine eyes, the one weeping and mourning, the other laughing and rejoicing. And he went again across the way, and Mary said to Joseph, Take me down from the ass, for that which is in me presses to come forth. But Joseph replied, Whither shall I take thee? For the place is desert. Then said Mary again to Joseph, Take me down, for that which is within me mightily presses me. And Joseph took her down, and he found her a cave and led her into it. Chapter 13 Joseph seeks a Hebrew midwife, perceives the fowl stopping in their flight, the working people at their food not moving, the sheep standing still, the shepherd fixed and immovable, and kids with their mouths touching the water but not drinking. And leaving her and his sons in the cave, Joseph went forth to seek a Hebrew midwife in the village of Bethlehem. But as I was going, said Joseph, I looked up into the air and I saw the clouds astonished and the falls of the air stopping in the midst of their flight. And I looked down towards the earth and saw a table spread and working people sitting around it, but their hands were upon the table, and they did not move to eat. They who had meat in their mouths did not eat. They who lifted their hands up to their heads did not draw them back. And they who lifted them up to their mouths did not put anything in it. But all their faces were fixed upwards. And I beheld the sheep dispersed, and yet the sheep stood still. And the shepherd lifted up his hand to smite them, and his hand continued up. And I looked into a river, and saw the kids with their mouths close to the water, and touching it, but they did not drink. Chapter 14 Joseph finds a midwife. A bright cloud overshadows the cave. A great light in the cave gradually increases until the infant is born. The midwife goes out and tells Salome that she has seen a virgin bring forth. Salome doubts it. Her hand withers. She supplicates the Lord, is cured, but warned not to declare what she had seen. Then I beheld a woman coming down from the mountains, and she said to me, Where art thou going, O man? And I said to her, I go to inquire for a Hebrew midwife. She replied to me, Where is the woman that is to be delivered? And I answered, 
in the cave, and she is betrothed to me. Then said the midwife, Is she not thy wife? Joseph answered, It is Mary, who was educated in the Holy of Holies, in the house of the Lord. And she fell to my lot, and is not my wife, but has conceived by the Holy Ghost. The midwife said, Is this true? And he answered, Come and see. And the midwife went along with him and stood in the cave. Then a bright cloud overshadowed the cave, and the midwife said, This day my soul is magnified, for mine eyes have seen surprising things, and salvation is brought forth to Israel. But on a sudden the cloud became a great light in the cave, so that their eyes could not bear it. But the light gradually decreased until the infant appeared and sucked the breast of his mother, Mary. Then the midwife cried out and said, How glorious a day is this, wherein mine eyes have seen this extraordinary sight. And the midwife went out from the cave, and Salome met her. And the midwife said to her, Salome, Salome, I will tell you a most surprising thing which I saw. A virgin had brought forth which is a thing contrary to nature. To which Salome replied, As the Lord my God liveth, unless I receive particular proof of this matter, I will not believe that a virgin had brought forth. Then Salome went in, and the midwife said, Mary, shew thyself for a great controversy is risen concerning thee. And Salome received satisfaction. But her hand was withered, and she groaned bitterly, and she said, Woe to me because of mine iniquity, for I have tempted the living God, and my hand is ready to drop off. Then Salome made her supplication to the Lord and said, O God of my fathers, remember me, for I am the seed of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Make me not a reproach among the children of Israel, Restore me sound to my parents. For thou will knowest, O Lord, that I have performed many offices of charity in thy name, and have received my reward from thee. Upon this an angel of the Lord stood by Salome and said, The Lord God had heard thy prayer. Reach forth thy hand to the child, and carry him. And by that means thou shalt be restored. Salome, filled with exceeding joy, went to the child and said, I will touch him, and purposed to worship him, for she said, This is a great king which is born in Israel. And straightway Salome was cured. Then the midwife went out of the cave, being approved by God. And lo, a voice came to Salome, Declare not the strange things which thou hast seen till the child shall come to Jerusalem. So Salome also departed, approved by God. Chapter 15 Wise men come from the east. He wrought alarmed, desires them if they find the child to bring him word. They visit the cave and offer the child their treasure, and being warned in a dream, do not return till he wrought, but go home another way. Then Joseph was preparing to go away, because there arose a great disorder in Bethlehem by the coming of some wise men from the east, who said, Where is the king of the Jews born? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod heard this, he was exceedingly troubled, and sent messengers to the wise men and to the priests, and inquired of them in the town hall. And said unto them, Where have you it written concerning Christ the King, or where should he be born? Then they say unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a ruler, who shall rule my people Israel. And having sent away the chief priests, he inquired of the men in the town hall, and said unto them, What sign was it yea concerning the king that is born? They answered him, 
we saw an extraordinary large star shining among the stars of heaven, and so outshined all the other stars, as that they became not visible. <coughs> And we knew thereby that a great king was born in Israel, and therefore we are come to worship him. Then said he wrote to them, Go and make diligent inquiry, and if you find a child, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. So the wise men went forth, and behold, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over the cave where the young child was with Mary his mother. Then they brought forth out of their treasures and offered unto him gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream by an angel that they should not return till he wrought through Judea, they departed into their own country by another way. Chapter 16 <coughs> Herod, in rage, orders the infants in Bethlehem to be slain. Mary puts her infant in an ox manger. Elizabeth flees with her son, John, to the mountains. A mountain miraculously divides and receives them. Herod, incensed at the escape of John, causes Zacharias to be murdered at the altar. The roofs of the temple rent, the body miraculously conveyed, and the blood petrified. Israel mourns for him. Simeon chosen his successor by lot. Then he wrote, perceiving that he was mocked by the wise men, and being very angry, he commanded certain men to go and to kill all the children that were in Bethlehem, from two years old and under. But Mary, hearing that the children were to be killed, being under much fear, took the child and wrapped him up in swaddling clothes and laid him in an ox manger. It's alluded to, though misapplied as the time, because there was no room for them in the inn. Elizabeth also, hearing that her son John was about to be searched for, took him and went up onto the mountains and looked around for a place to hide him. And there was no secret place to be found. Then she groaned within herself and said, O mountain of the Lord, receive the mother with the child. For Elizabeth could not climb up, and instantly the mountain was divided and received them. And there appeared to them an angel of the Lord to preserve them. But he wrote, made search after John, and sent servants to Zacharias when he was ministering at the altar, and said unto him, Where hast thou hid thy son? He replied to them, I am minister of God and a servant at the altar. How should I know where my son is? So the servants went back and told he wrote the whole at which he was incensed and said, Is not the son of his like to be king in Israel? He sent therefore again his servants to Zechariah, saying, Tell us the truth, where is thy son? For you know that your life is in my hand. So the servants went and told him all this, but Zechariah replied to them, I am a martyr for God, and if he shed my blood, the Lord will receive my soul. Besides, no die shed innocent blood. However, Zacharias was murdered in the entrance of the temple and the altar and about the partition. But the children of Israel knew not when he was killed. Then at the hour of salutation, the priests went into the temple. But Zacharias did not, according to custom, meet them and bless them. Yet they still continued waiting for him to salute them. And when they found he did not in a long time come, one of them ventured into the holy place where the altar was, and he saw blood lying upon the ground, congealed. When behold, a voice from heaven said, Zacharias is murdered, and his blood shall not be wiped away. 
until the revenger of his blood come. But when he heard this, he was afraid, and went forth and told the priests what he had seen and heard. And they all went in, and saw the fact. Then the roofs of the temple howled, and were rent from the top to the bottom. And they could not find the body, but only blood made hard like stone. And they went awry and told the people that Zacharias was murdered. And all the tribes of Israel heard thereof and mourned for him, and lamented three days. Note, King, they shed the blood of the innocent. They polluted the court that day was the Sabbath and the day of expiation. When therefore Nebuzaradan came there, Jerusalem, he saw his blood bubbling and said to them, What meaneth this? They answered, It is the blood of calves, lambs, and rams, which we have offered upon the altar. He commanded then that they should bring calves and lambs and rams, and said, I will try whether this be their blood. Accordingly, they brought and slew them, but the blood of Zechariah still bubbled. But the blood of these did not bubble. Then he said, Declare to me the truth of the matter, or else I will comb your flesh with iron combs. Then said they to him, He was a priest, prophet, and judge, who prophesied to Israel all these calamities which we have suffered from you. But we arose against him and slew him. Then said he, I will appease him. Then he took the ravens and slew them upon his Zechariah's blood. And he was not yet a beast. Next he took the young boys from the schools and slew them upon his blood, and yet it bubbled. Then he brought the young priests and slew them in the same place, and yet it still bubbled. So he slew at length ninety-four thousand persons upon his blood, and it did not as yet cease bubbling. Then he drew near to it and said, O Zacharias, Zacharias, thou hast occasioned the death of the chief of the countrymen. Shall I slay them all? Then the blood ceased, and it bubble no more. Then the priests took counsel together concerning a person to succeed him. And Simeon and other priests cast lots, and the lot fell upon Simeon. For he had been assured by the Holy Spirit that he should not die till he had seen Christ come in the flesh. I, James, wrote this history in Jerusalem. And when the disturbance was, I retired into a desert place until the death of Herod. And the disturbance ceased at Jerusalem. That which remains is that I glorify God that he hold given me such wisdom to write unto you who are spiritual and who love God, to whom be ascribed glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.